Um, this, this triple murder rock creek was started, a small northern Cape Town. Um, I mean, they have, there's nothing like four murders in the area. Uh, you know, there were helicopters in the area, there were dog units. They tried to find out, to find the killers. Chad, this is the perfect family. I mean, you had a successful father. You had a mom who was, in her own right, uh, very successful in the baking business. And she was involved in community. Um, she had a beauty queen daughter. The son wasn't doing too badly himself. And from every aspect, from every vantage point outside, it looked like they were the perfect family. And that's almost the sense you also, when you read the story, everybody thought so too. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is Episode 6, The Krikostat Murders. Before we get into the case, I'd like to briefly chat about a podcast I came across that I think may be beneficial to some of our listeners. Insomnia and sleeping problems are very common in today's hectic world of constant rushing and information overload, and if we aren't getting enough sleep, it affects so many areas of our lives. Before turning to chemical sleep aids, it's always best to try alternative methods first. Sleepy Time Tales podcast is a sleep aid podcast, which I highly recommend. Here's Dave from Sleepy Time Tales podcast to tell you about his show. Good evening, friends. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Do you find your mind spinning and churning while you're trying to get to sleep? Maybe I can help. Listen to Sleepy Time Tales, a sleep podcast aimed at helping you to get a restful night. Find it at sleepytimetales.net or search for it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm a huge believer in helping others grow and be successful. And as such, I will be using this platform on occasion to promote other content creators where I feel that that content can add value to our listeners. In previous episodes, I've promoted the YouTube channels No Going Home and Mfundo Ndala. There's also a very cool young lady in Naisna who runs the Books and Booze podcast. You can check her out on Spotify too. This case was suggested by listeners Corin Stadler and Jennifer Faulkner on our Facebook page. Ladies, thank you for listening and for your insightful comments about this case. If you'd like to suggest a case for us to cover, please head over to our Facebook page where there's a pinned post for case suggestions. You're also welcome to contact me on Twitter and Instagram. In researching this case, I used two main resources. The first is a podcast called Profiler Africa, who did an episode on this case in which they interviewed Gerard Labaskagni and Bronwyn Stolas both of whom worked in the investigative psychology unit at SAPS around the time that this case was at trial. I highly recommend the Profiler Africa series and will post a link to their podcast in the show notes. The other main resource I used was a book by veteran journalist Jacques Steenkamp, no relation, called The Griekwistat Murders. I also highly recommend this book for a serious deep dive into this case. Jacques covered this case from beginning to end, and he was in the courtroom for almost every word of the trial. I've included quite a bit of information about the case here, but Jacques' book really delves into the minutiae of the evidence, and it is fascinating. I will also leave a link to purchase that book in the show notes. Jacques Stienkamp was approached to write the screenplay for a movie about this tragedy, which is currently filming in Hopefield, Western Cape and will be released later this year. I would like to advise our listeners that this episode contains graphic descriptions of the victim's injuries as well as discussion about sexual assault. If you are triggered by either of these topics, please keep that in mind before listening to this episode. Let's get into it. On Friday the 6th of April, 2012, the farm called Nohook, 8 kilometers from Krikwistat town centre, had fallen silent. The chatter of the family that lived there had ceased. The television bled on, but those who had been watching it just moments before were now dead. 
the computer screen had yet to buzz off into sleep mode, but its operator too lay slumped nearby, no longer breathing. Just before seven o'clock in the evening, a white Isuzu Bucky screeched to a halt in front of the Krikwistad police station. Warrant officers Anthony Volt and Klaus Roy watched the dust settle around the vehicle. The Bucky's door opened and a young man stepped out. His brown hair was tasseled and he still wore braces on his teeth. He rushed into the police station and before the officers could address him, he dropped to his knees in front of them, screaming, You must come. They've been shot. They're all dead. The boy was 15-year-old Don Steenkamp, and he was referring to his mother, father, and sister. Warrant Officer Roy helped the boy to his feet, and that was when he noticed the blood. The boy was drenched in it. His t-shirt, hands, and legs caked red. He walked on out of the back door of the police station into a courtyard area where they could speak privately and asked him to explain what had happened. The boy said that his family had been watching television and he had gone into the barn to fix a light. He had heard gunshots and hid in the barn and then, when the gunshots stopped, he ran inside and found his family dead. The two officers were almost frozen in shock. They had known the Steenkamp family, as everyone knows everyone in Krikwistat. Their tiny town did not see horrendous murders of this nature. Their region had barely been touched by the national scourge of farm murders. But this boy was telling them that all that had just changed in one fleeting moment, and Krikwistat would never be the same. Vult quickly snapped himself out of his shock realizing that he needed to alert his superiors. He made several calls, including one to the local detective unit. Within minutes, the station was crawling with police officers. They needed to get to Nohook as quickly as possible to secure the scene and ensure all the victims were indeed deceased. In their haste to mobilize to the farm, their primary witness was left to his own devices, in the care of the two warrant officers. Don Steenkamp had wanted to accompany the officers to the farm, but he was instructed to stay behind. The head of the Northern Cape Organised Crime Unit arrived at Krikostad Police Station shortly after the police contingent had left. Colonel Dick Deval was off duty that night, but his wife, who held the rank of general in the SAPS, was the one who received the call from the Krikostad Police Station. The officer who was on duty that weekend could not be reached, so Duval had taken the case. In my opinion, this was a stroke of luck, because Duval is a highly respected police officer with 30 years at service under his belt. Considering the complexity which would soon become evident in this case, it may have played out very differently had a less experienced detective been assigned to the case. Duval is also extremely knowledgeable about the Northern Cape region, the crimes that tend to take place there, and how these crimes usually present themselves. This experience would also prove vital. When Duval arrived, he was advised that Don Steenkamp had been taken across the road to Hrikwistat's only restaurant, Proviand, so that community members could comfort him and provide him with food and drink. He asked the Warren's officers whether they had taken a statement or collected any physical evidence from the boy. Roy described the huge amount of blood that had caked on Steenkamp's hands, shirt and legs, but said that they had not been instructed to collect any evidence, nor take photographs. Duval went over to the restaurant and was met with a wall of Steenkamp's extended family members, who did not want to see Don further traumatised by immediately being questioned by police. It took some convincing, but the family members eventually agreed that Don could accompany Duval across the road to the police station. When the boy stood up, Duval immediately realised that he had, at some point, cleaned himself up. There were still traces of blood, but the caking of blood which the officers had mentioned was gone. It would later emerge that the warrant officers had seen Don washing his hands and legs, but had not wanted to upset him any further by asking him to stop. 
At this time, of course, Don was an innocent victim of a horrific tragedy, not a suspect. Duvall had physical evidence collected from Don, including swabs of the traces of blood that remained on his skin and scrapings from underneath his fingernails. A scratch mark on his neck was photographed. The shirt he had been wearing when he arrived at the police station was found in a bush outside. Duvall asked Don why he'd been in such a hurry to clean up. He stated that his sister had died in his arms and her blood had been all over him. In his own words, he described being disgusted by this and anxious to get the blood off. Duvall had sent Don home with his father's cousin that night and asked him to meet at the police station the next day for a full statement. He then drove the eight kilometres to Nohook to attend the scene. Nohook was one of five farms belonging to Dion Steenkamp, Don's deceased father. Dion had been born on the farm, and on that night, the family land had seen his passing there too. The Steenkamps predominantly farmed sheep, although they also kept a few head of cattle and some horses, the latter of which were for recreation purposes. The Steenkamps lived in the main house on the property. There was a barn nearby, and on the outskirts of the farm, close to the road. The farm labourers had their own houses. The first officer on the scene that night, Detective Morfa King, was head of detectives for the region. He had entered the property to check on the victims, and once he had ascertained that they were indeed deceased, he had cleared the house for any intruders and waited outside for forensic analysts to arrive. The community of Hrikwistat along with most farming communities, are extremely safety conscious. In the last decade or so in South Africa, farmers and people living in remote areas have become targets for vicious, opportunistic robberies, which often end in murder. The remoteness of the properties makes it easy for perpetrators to commit these crimes without being caught, and although motives vary from simple robbery to revenge attacks by ex-workers, all attacks of this kind have now become synonymous with the label of farm murders or farm attacks. As a result, farmers have mobilized security forces, often made up of volunteers from their own communities, a kind of highly militant neighborhood watch. Although Hrikwistat had yet to experience any such attacks, their community had educated themselves and prepared for such an eventuality. Dion Stiankamp's neighbor, Joe Scoltz, was tasked with representing the community at crime scenes, and when he received the phone call to inform him of the murders of three of his neighbors and friends, the Stiankamps, he immediately got into his bucky and drove the few kilometers that separated his farm and Nohook. Scoltz would later describe arriving at the scene and finding three young policemen who had been tasked with securing the scene. Scoltz was well known to the local police through his work in community policing, and when he asked if he could go inside to check for survivors, the officers agreed and said they would accompany him. Scoltz had been friends with the Steenkamps for most of his life and had seen Motala and Don grow up. It must have been this closeness that made the discoveries Scoltz made in the house that night all the more difficult to stomach. Scoltz walked through the kitchen and into the dining room and immediately saw all three bodies laying in close proximity. Dion and Christelle were laying on their stomachs. Both had a significant amount of blood covering their bodies and obvious bullet wounds to their upper bodies. Dion was wearing blue rugby shorts and a navy blue shirt with the words South Africa printed on the back. A green jacket lay near his head. There were two clearly visible small caliber bullet wounds to the back of his head. Martella had also been shot, but Scorse noticed that her face was bloodied, bruised and swollen. She was dressed in a green shirt and shorts, and her body faced her mother. It would later be reported that Martella's face was so badly beaten that it was no longer recognizable as that of a human being. When Colonel Duval searched the crime scene later that night, 
he uncovered a t-shirt in Don's bedroom. It was underneath a towel and covered in blood. The neck of the shirt had been torn. This t-shirt would become a pivotal piece of evidence in the case. Joe Schultz had studied farm murders and viewed countless videos and photographs of farm murder crime scenes. Looking at the scene at Nohook, it did not feel like a farm attack. The Steenkamp's four dogs were all running around the scene. In most farm attacks, the dogs will be poisoned first. The safe stood open, with numerous firearms in plain view, which had been left behind. There was no sign of a break-in either. It didn't feel right. Something very bad happened at Nohook that night, and it went far deeper than a farm attack. The impact of the murder of the Steenkamps on the Grikwistad community was immense. Not only had their murders brought an evil far too close to home, but the family was well-known and well-loved. Dion Steenkamp was 44 years old at the time of his death. He came from a long line of farmers, and his family had amassed a sizable fortune in land and assets. Dion was a large, imposing figure. His shirt size was 5XL. But if you look at pictures of him, he doesn't appear overweight. There's a little paunch, but overall, he's just a very large-built man no doubt helped by many years of physical labour on the farms. Dion comes across as quite a serious man, but in family pictures, there's definitely a softer side that shines through. He coached the under-18 boys and girls teams in tent pegging, which is a very popular equestrian sport in the area. His sister later told journalists that Dion had been a lot lummocky, born to his mother when she was 42 years old and after she had suffered two miscarriages. Being the only boy of three children and significantly younger than his sisters, he had been doted upon by the entire family. Dion was a pillar of his community. He was a deacon at the local church, served on the church's financial committee and was part of the local farmers' union. He had been an excellent student in his youth and had been head boy of his school. Dion's wife, Christelle, was 43 years old at the time of her death. She was by all accounts an extremely hard worker, who always had many projects on the go. She has been described as a loving and caring mother, and photographs clearly show that she was devoted to her husband. She played a very active role in her church and had started a biscuit-making and distribution business just a few months before her death, which was going very well. She was also an avid gardener. She ensured that her children's success at tent pegging events got good coverage by freelancing for the newspaper Volksblatt. Christelle's sister described the enormous effort that her sister and Dion made to ensure that their children could come home from boarding school on as many weekends as possible. Their schools were both in Bloemfontein, which is 330 kilometers from Hikustat, which means that they would have had to spend 12 hours a week driving their children back and forth. Dion's sister would later dispel rumors that Christelle had relied on her husband for money by saying that she was well off in her own right, so money had never been an issue for the couple. Martana was just 14 years old at the time of her murder. She was an absolutely beautiful girl, and yet her photographs don't show a hint of arrogance. She seems completely comfortable in her own skin, and her ready smile is welcoming. Martella was in that cusp between girlhood and womanhood. In her bright yellow school uniform, she is the picture of innocence, and when pictured wearing civvies, you see more of the young lady that she was growing into. By all accounts, She was a very popular girl and reportedly had a bubbly, vibrant personality to match. Martello was seen as a golden child. She was well-rounded, attractive, intelligent and kind. Everything she touched was successful. Martello's aunt joked that the girl had always said she wanted to be a perfectionist when she grew up until she found out that you don't get paid to be one. 
the family in general was well respected and no one reported any behaviour within the family which struck them as odd. Dion's sister told a journalist that she often envied her brother's family as they seemed so loving and happy. Both Martella and Don attended boarding school during the week, which is common for children in farming communities. They would come home on weekends and during holidays. Considering how well off the family was, I am very surprised to look at the photographs of their home and see how modestly it is furnished. The structure itself is simple and functional. The lounge where Christelle and Martella's bodies were found consists of a collection of mismatched couches and wicker chairs. Some of the surfaces are quite cluttered, but the furnishings are sparse. This family had no airs and graces about them. Despite their wealth, they were down-to-earth people. Dion's sister described the family as laid back and said they loved to tease one another and joke. As parents, she described Dion and Christelle as strict but fair and they would occasionally treat their children but had avoided spoiling them. Police searched the scene until daybreak, sending out police dogs onto the property to search for possible perpetrators. On Saturday, the 7th of April 2012, South Africa woke up to the news of a brutal family slaying. Almost immediately, it was attributed in the public's mind to a farm murder. It was the easiest assumption, and of course, it fit the political motives of many to assume that this was racially motivated. Perhaps it would have been easier to accept this as a motive than the horrible truth which would soon come to light. Early that morning, Colonel Duval met with Don at the police station and he was taken to a hospital to be examined by a doctor and have any injuries to his body recorded. After this, Duval took Don to Nohook so that he could point out his version of events at the scene. Duval would later recall that the drive with Don was filled with chatter from the boy. He bragged about how fast he had driven his father's vehicle the previous night, and then, quite suddenly and without prompting, asked the police officer what he needed to do in order to inherit all of his family's belongings. Don's extended family very quickly appointed a lawyer to care for the boy's legal needs. In his parents' will, they had named a retired school principal and neighbour, Paul Buerta, to become their children's guardian in the event of their deaths. Don Steenkamp did not spend a single night in Buerta's care. He declined to act as Don's guardian, saying that due to the nature of the circumstances, he felt that he would be doing his own family a disservice by bringing the child into his home. Don's tent-pegging coach, Benny Heckert, would eventually take over guardianship of the minor, although the arrangement was always found to be strange by those who knew Dion, as they were well aware that he and Heckert had not been close at all while he was alive. A police spokesperson gave a statement to the press, in which they stated that they were not looking for any suspects at the time. They were analysing the evidence at the scene and witness statements. This announcement created a frenzy among the media and public alike, as suddenly there was a possibility that the so-called farm murder was not a farm murder at all. Unsubstantiated rumours began doing the rounds that Dion had killed his wife and daughter before turning the gun on himself. There was even speculation that Martella had been involved in satanic activities and that that had been the reason for the murders, given that the incident occurred over Easter weekend, which is said to be a particularly important period for satanic sacrifices. Of course, these speculations were all made without any of the evidence having come to light. Journalists became extremely frustrated in this case, as almost every piece of evidence or move the police made was closely guarded. On the Saturday afternoon following the murders, the community of Hrikwistat gathered at Nohook to help clean and clear the Steenkamp residence. The police had finalised their collection of evidence from the scene and gave permission to friends and family to enter and clean the house. Joe Scoltz found the green jacket that had been near Dion's body still in the house, the police had reportedly seen no reason to collect it as evidence, 
and Skolt had proceeded to burn it. The autopsies were performed on the victims during the week after their murders. The following information is difficult to listen to. I would not ordinarily include information like this unless, as I believe is the case here, the results of the autopsy speak to a motive or method behind the crime. If you feel that this may be too much to handle, I recommend you skip forward a few seconds to pass this section. The state pathologist determined that all three victims had been shot with both the 22 caliber rifle and the .357 Magnum revolver. Dion had received three bullet wounds, one in his right shoulder, another in the back of his head, and one behind his ear. He also had severe blunt force injuries to his head. Crystal had been shot twice, once in the back and once in the back of her head. Martella had been shot four times, twice in the chest and twice in the face. The chest wounds came first, and the pathologist determined that she would have bled out quite quickly after these wounds. The shots to her face were likely suffered after she had already died, as there was little blood around these wounds indicating that the heart had already stopped beating by the time the bullet entered her body. Martella had received a severe beating, in addition to the gunshot wounds. The pathologist believed that these may have been from the butt of a revolver, and were received while she was still alive, and possibly fighting her attacker. The most stunning revelation from the autopsies came when it was discovered that Martella had been sexually assaulted shortly before her murder. In fact, it was discovered that the most recent injury had reopened an older, healed sexual injury. Martella had been raped, and on more than one occasion. This information would only be revealed publicly at a later stage, but it was at this moment that investigators suddenly had a very real motive developed for this crime. The reason that I felt it important to share the information about the autopsies is that Besides the sexual element, there is a clear distinction between how the victims were treated. Cristal was killed almost instantly, very possibly without suffering much pain. Dion suffered a beating, which his wife did not have to endure. The worst violence was saved for Martella, and she was also the only victim who was shot while the perpetrator was facing her. I don't think that the gunshots and physical beating to her beautiful face were an accident either. Martella was absolutely the object of her attacker's violent rage. The others were collateral damage. Another important point that was noted in the inspection of the crime scene was that there were no signs of a build-up. Often in crimes of passion or rage, one will see furniture turned over or items smashed as an argument builds and reaches crescendo. There was none of this at no hook. It was as though the perpetrator had simply walked straight up to the victims and unleashed hell on earth. With the autopsies complete, the Steenkamps could be laid to rest and their grieving families could have a moment to say their goodbyes. The memorial service was hugely attended and in a sweet story of the power of friendship, a busload of school friends from Martella's school in Bloemfontein made the 350-kilometer journey to attend her memorial. At the time, there were protests on one of the roads they needed to take, and the road had been closed. Don's schoolmates, who were traveling the same road, turned around and went back to Bloemfontein, but not Martella's friends. The busload of girls and female teachers simply found a different, albeit longer, route and continued to Krikwestad. Ten kilometres before their destination, their bus blew a tyre and they had to hitch a ride on a cattle truck to church. Nothing was going to stop them from honouring their beautiful, kind friend because, no doubt, she would have done the same for them. I've seen pictures of these schoolgirls at the Steenkamp's memorial service and there isn't a word in the English language to describe the expression on their faces. Devastation just isn't descriptive enough. The only way I can describe it is, I think that that is what the death of innocence looks like. These young girls, most in their early teens, 
had not just lost a friend. They had the idea that childhood is fun and innocence and carefree, ripped away from them. Their friend hadn't died in a car accident or of an illness, which would have been tragic enough. She had been brutalized and most likely died with the most intense fear any human could imagine. When I look at those girls' faces, it is clear that they will never see the world, family or friendship in the same way again, because their lives were all tainted on the night a madman lost his mind. I watched a brief snippet of the memorial service that I found on YouTube. The footage shows Don Steenkamp, flanked by both pairs of grandparents. His face is a little red, perhaps from crying. At one point during the sermon, he seems to succumb to a sudden, deep, sobbing cry, but it lasts only seconds. He makes a bobbing motion with his head as his hand presses on the bridge of his nose and his face crumples slightly. In this moment, his grandfather looks at him and then looks away, shaking his head. He then bites his lip to stop the tears that are already flowing down his face. I don't know what that head shake meant. Perhaps it was a subconscious denial of the terrible situation this young man found himself in. Or perhaps it was an expression of disbelief. I cannot speak for the man, but I can say that there was one very big difference between Don and his grandfather in that moment, and that difference was tears. Despite his best attempts not to cry, Don's grandfather did. But Don's cheeks were dry. His face was crumpled, and he made all the right sounds. But I didn't personally see a single tear in that video. In the weeks after his family's death, while the police were conducting their investigation and doing their best to avoid the media, Don Stiankamp returned to school at Gray College in Bloemfontein. It would later be reported that Don returned a very different boy than the day he had left for those fateful Easter holidays. He was described as a quiet young man, an introvert. He had a few close friends, but he was far from the social butterfly his sister was, and he hadn't had much luck with the girls either. Teachers reported meeting a new Don on his return, though. Suddenly, he was loud and brash, almost arrogant, and very close to impossible to control in class. He was the object of attention for the first time, and he was lapping it up. Girls were swarming around him, and he was almost unrecognizable from the boy he had been before the death of his family members. Teachers had been prepared to have to protect him and nurture him, even take it easy on him if he struggled to cope, but they had been completely unprepared for the bragging, brash Don Steenkamp that stood before them. Despite family members telling him that he didn't need to attend, Don insisted on competing in a tent-pegging competition shortly after the murders. He also insisted on riding his sister's horse in the competition, and journalists reported that he happily posed for photographs. Don Steenkamp had continued to live with Benny Hekruet, despite his family saying that he was most welcome to stay with them. His answer described his decision to live with Hekruet as one he seemed to think was his to make. He hadn't discussed it with them, and had simply packed his belongings and left with the man. As the investigation progressed, though, and the harsh reality started to be revealed, they were glad for the distance. It would have been unbearable to have to deal with a child living in the same house as them when the story began to unravel. Police were in no rush to release any information to the public and kept insisting that they could not name any suspects, nor could they state what the motive for the crime could be. Journalists in the know, such as Jacques Dienkamp, knew differently, though. Jacques had been close to the case since day one, and he had identified a suspect in his own mind, but knew that police would not easily announce his identity. Official statements were that they were waiting for the outcome of forensic and ballistic tests, before they drew any final conclusions. And so, Hrikwastat was left to wait, as was the rest of South Africa, for an answer to the riddle, who killed the Steenkamps? 
Of course, many fingers were already pointing at the sole survivor of the massacre. Rumours abounded that Don was adopted, and that he had found out on the night of the murders. To be clear, Don Steenkamp is absolutely the biological child of both Dion and Christelle. Some started to wonder whether the police simply did not have enough evidence to charge him. After all, he'd been allowed to wash himself, which destroyed not only blood evidence, but also gunshot residue. The parents of Don's schoolmates were less than impressed that their children were sharing a dormitory with a boy who had yet to be exonerated by police for the murder of three of his family members. Gray College received so many complaints from parents that they eventually had to ask Don to leave or risk losing half their students. Benny Hekruert and Don's relations had responded strongly to this request, insisting that they could not treat Don like a convicted murderer when he wasn't even officially a suspect. Put in an extremely difficult situation, the school relented and allowed Don back. I tend to think that no one had bothered to ask Don what he wanted when this happened, as he had reportedly told several people that he didn't want to attend Gray College anymore, as his schoolmates had been teasing and bullying him and spreading vicious rumours about him. In reality, I think Don had just realised that he was about to become a very rich 15-year-old boy that owned five farms and there was really no need for him to continue his education. Several forensic experts voiced their opinion during the time that police were continually claiming to be waiting for test results. None of the opinions were very flattering, and experts who had worked on cases as high-profile as the Inga Lotz investigation pointed out that it was very possible that police had failed to properly collect evidence, or that it had been contaminated. One man stated that a murder investigation should take no longer than four weeks, but with the backlog in the SAPS forensics, he was not surprised that four months later they were still waiting. Eventually, in August 2012, a docket was filed with the Director of Public Prosecutions. It is the DPP's responsibility to review evidence on a case and determine whether there is sufficient evidence to make an arrest. Don Steenkamp turned 16 in that same month, and on the 21st of August, he was called out of his classroom at Gray College. On entering the principal's office, he was handcuffed and placed under arrest by Colonel Dick Duval. At precisely the same time, a search warrant was executed on his bedroom at the Hickroot residence. Don, although initially shocked at his sudden arrest, quickly regained his composure and was marched through the school grounds to his dorm room through crowds of peers on their lunch break. His room was searched and then he was marched back out through the throngs of shocked students and teachers to Dick Duvall's vehicle. Some have entertained the possibility that the lead investigator had planned the arrest for break time to ensure that his suspect was put under maximum pressure. Such an extreme situation could make even the most hardened criminal crack, never mind a 16-year-old boy. But not this boy. The boy walked, stone-faced, through the crowds, never so much as breaking a sweat or frowning. In complete contrast... Duval later recalled that as they were driving, a news broadcast had come across the radio announcing the arrest of a 16-year-old suspect in the murders of the Steenkamp family. Duval had been keeping an eye on the boy in the rearview mirror, and as this was announced, he was shocked to see a small smile creep across Don's face. Somewhere in the dark alcoves of Don Steenkamp's mind, he found this all very amusing. The handling of this case would be very different from other murder trials, as the accused was a minor. Don Steenkamp would be protected by the Child Justice Act, and as such, his identity could not be revealed until he was 18. Because of this, a rather ridiculous rhetoric permeated the entire trial, as well as all media coverage. The public knew that the sole survivor of the Steenkamp massacre 
was 16-year-old Don Steenkamp. They also knew that he had been suspected, at the very least by the court of public opinion, almost since day one. But every mention of the suspect in court or in the media had to be completely anonymous. The court ruled that the accused could not even be referred to as a minor, but only as the accused. I fully understand why this law exists, and agree that minor children should enjoy anonymity during court proceedings until proven guilty. But to coin a phrase the judge used on many occasions, it was a case of closing the stable door after the horse had already bolted. The state was represented by advocate Klutter, at the time, one of the best trial attorneys in the country. It seemed a good omen for the state that Klutter was working the trial where Duval was the investigating officer, as the pair had never lost a case when working together. Don Steenkamp was charged with three counts of premeditated murder. With such serious charges, his defence team would have a job before them to get him granted bail. At his bail hearing, his long-standing champion, Benny Hickert, testified in his defence. Don's counsel also hired a private social worker to testify to Don's state of mind. Unfortunately for the defence, it was revealed during the bail hearing that this so-called private social worker was actually a relative of Hickeritz, which cast serious doubts on his testimony. During the bail hearing, it emerged that Don's attorney had informed him six weeks after his family's murder that he was a suspect in the case. This was shocking to all present, as it meant that despite the police's continual claims of not having identified a suspect, they had, all along, been driving the investigation with Don in mind. It also meant that Don had known for a very long time that he was a suspect, but his frivolous and arrogant behaviour had certainly not shown this. For journalists, this cemented how desperate the police had been to ensure secrecy in this case. For many veteran journalists, it was the first time they had experienced such behaviour by the police. I'm in two minds about how the police handled this. Yes, there is the suspect's age to consider, and I assume that due to a few already admitted bungles in the investigation and the high-profile nature of the case, They were desperate to ensure that nothing more slipped through the cracks. I don't think they needed to be deceptive, though. For me, it would have been far better if they had simply made no comment, or advised that they were not willing to release any information at the time. It was not necessary to be blatantly deceptive by saying that they had no suspects. Possibly, at some time, this may have been a ploy to ease the boy into a false sense of security in the hopes that he would start talking to people, But if he had already been advised of his status as a suspect six weeks after the murder, then this theory holds no water. I guess the question is, which was more important to them? Making sure they had an airtight case against the murderer of three people, or maintaining a level of cooperation with the press and public? Of course, the first is more important, but I still think it could have been handled differently. Advocate Clutter for the state told the court that if the accused was let out on bail, he could not guarantee the safety of those around him. The defence counsel's entire argument for bail was built on him needing to continue with his education. They tried to use the fact that Grey College was a prestigious institution of education as a reason that the accused should be released to continue attending. For some journalists attending, It seemed as though they were trying to use the fact that the accused was from a wealthy family as some sort of evidence that he would not be a risk to grant bail to. While Don was being held in custody initially, it appeared that he was being granted special privileges. Certain members of the Hrikwistad community complained that if they were arrested, they were paraded through the streets into the courthouse, while Don had been smuggled into the courtroom surreptitiously to avoid the media getting photographs of him. It was also reported that his family had been allowed to bring him pillows and blankets, as well as takeaway food, as he couldn't stomach the jail food. The bail hearing was widely covered, as it would be the first time that the state would reveal any of its evidence against the accused. This didn't seem to affect Don in any way, though, 
as it was reported that at no time during the bail hearing did he seem concerned or upset. He sat throughout with his now trademark stone face, only breaking to sometimes joke with his counsel or supporters. The bail hearing lasted two days, and at the end, the magistrate asked for ten days to consider his findings. During that time, the accused would remain incarcerated. Only at this moment, when his freedom was at risk, did he break down. Weeks later, though, Don would be granted bail. The judge seemed to take his age into account, and also stated that he had been living freely since the murders, with access to firearms, and he had not harmed anyone so he could not see any evidence that he was a danger to society. The judge's decision was not accepted by the state, and they almost immediately filed a submission to appeal his bail. Gray College also issued an instruction, stating that they would not allow Don to attend their school until his trial was complete, and if he was found not guilty, they would consider allowing him re-entry. To their credit, The school offered ways in which Don could continue with his education. They offered to have his homework delivered to him and arranged for him to submit assignments and write exams. The appeal against Don's bail was rejected by the judge and he was allowed to continue living with the Hickruitt family until his trial started. On the 11th of December 2012, Martella would have turned 15. Had she been alive, she would have joined her brother in competing in a Gymkhana event, which was held that weekend. Instead, she was remembered with a minute silence, and her team wore green ribbons on their uniforms, in remembrance. The December holidays were a sad time for the family, as it would be the first Christmas they would spend without Dion, Cristal and Martella. Don would not be able to travel anywhere during the holidays due to his bail conditions. The previous year, he had been invited to join a friend at the coast for the December holidays. His parents had refused to let him go. It emerged that shortly after the murders, Don had messaged this friend to say that he could now join him at the coast that year and no one could stop him and he would have a lot of money to spend. This information was given to journalist Jacques Steenkamp by Don's friend's father. It would not be the last of the disturbing messages sent by Don to come to light. The alleged sexual assault on Martella had broken in the news, but it was being denied by many players in the case until, three weeks before the trial was due to start, the police announced that they had added rape and obstruction of justice charges to the sheet. On the 11th of March 2013, almost a year after the murders of Dion, Cristal and Martella Steenkamp, the trial of their accused killer began. The state had alerted 91 witnesses that they may be called to testify at the trial. Don Steenkamp pleaded not guilty to all five charges against him. For the first time in the Northern Cape, a computer program called Crime Scene Forensics was used in a trial. The program uses a 360-degree view of a crime scene and allows the operator to zoom in on evidence and have a digital walkthrough of the crime scene. This was one of the first items presented as evidence by the state and would provide the first look into the crime scene for the public. Don had attended the scene with police soon after the murders to point out various things that were pertinent to his version of events. The first image in the virtual tour was of him pointing out where he claimed he found the guns near the farm gate on the night of the murders. According to his version, the perpetrators must have left them there, intending to take them with, but had either forgotten them or been scared off and not had time to take them. There had only been one set of tire tracks next to the area which belonged to the vehicle Don had used. There had also been no footprints. So police asked Don, how he had picked up the guns. He had claimed that he had stopped the vehicle next to the guns, held onto the steering wheel with one hand, and grasped the guns with the other hand, without setting a foot on the ground. The vehicle he was in was a double cab, and although tall, Don was not a fully grown adult man at this time, 
I find it difficult to believe that this would have been possible to achieve, considering the height of the vehicle off the ground. The guns were also found to be in perfect condition, with no residue of gravel, dust or grass having clung to them, despite there being small amounts of body fluids and tissue on the guns, which could have easily attracted dirt if the weapons had been left on the ground, as Don claimed. The virtual tour showed blood spatter on an external wall of the house. This was determined to be arterial spray, which likely splashed there during a struggle. Several blood drops are visible on the cement slabs and tiles leading to the door. The door has two sections, with the bottom part having a bullet hole through it. There is also blood on the hinges of the door. The family members had been warned that graphic images were about to be shown, but they all stayed seated, although when further footage was shown later, Dion's parents left the room. Inside the house, signs of normal life are shown. A dinner table with plates indicate the family had eaten a meal together. This small sense of normality is quickly demolished when the body of Dion Stiankamp is shown. To the right of his head, there was a large blood smear indicating that perhaps he had been dragged while already bleeding, or even tried to pull himself along the floor before succumbing to his injuries. The gunshots to Dion's head had very little blood around them, indicating that he had been initially shot, fallen, possibly tried to drag himself, but died, and then after he was already dead, he was shot in the head. Martella's body was shown next in the virtual tour. She was laying on her side, with her arm bent under her. Magazines lay scattered around her. There were blades of grass stuck to the back of her shirt. It would later be determined that in order for those blades of grass to have clung to her, she must have lay in the grass outside after she had been shot the first time. It has been reported that when pictures of Martella were shown, the courtroom fell completely silent. Many had tears in their eyes at the sight of this tiny girl, devastated beyond recognition. Don looked at the pictures too, but he appeared bored, and at one point, barely stifled a yawn. Cristal is laying on her stomach near Martella. She's wearing a blue shirt and denim skirt, which are both covered in blood. Further photos showed a phone handset which was off the hook near the bodies of Mortella and Cristal. It was covered in blood. It was determined that the blood on the handset was Mortella's. At some point during her attack, she tried to call for help. Don had been asked on several occasions why he had decided to leave the scene and drive to the police station that night, rather than just call for help in the hopes that a well-timed ambulance could save his family. His cell phone was in perfect working order that night. He had used it continuously after the murders. The home had a landline, yet he did not call for help. His answer was that he knew that his family was dead and beyond saving. He had claimed that he was afraid the perpetrators were still on the property and that they would come for him next. His account does not make any sense in my opinion. Even if he was afraid, he had a cell phone. He could have hidden somewhere and called for help. Martella, in her terror and pain, had thought clearly enough to try and get help instead of trying to flee. Her brother had seemingly not thought this important. Evidence was presented that confirmed that Don Steenkamp's clothes had tested positive for gunshot residue. His hands had tested negative, but of course, he had unfortunately been allowed to wash his hands at the police station. Gunshot residue, also known as cartridge discharge residue, is a fine material which is produced when a gun is fired. It consists of burnt and unburnt particles of explosive primer from a weapon, and may also include fine particles of bullet, cartridge, and the internal material of the firearm. Gunshot residue, or GSR tests, are generally conducted to ascertain whether a person has fired a gun, or being in extremely close proximity to a gun when it was fired. The positive testing for GSR on Don's clothing meant that he had either fired a gun within the prior six to eight hours, 
or he had been in an area where a gun had been fired within seconds of the discharge. It was Don's version that he had been in the barn when he heard the gunshots. So, failing him admitting actually firing the guns, he would have had to walk through the house seconds after the guns were fired in order to get GSR on his clothing. Don's explanation for this was that he had been shooting near cats on the farm earlier in the day, and that is when the GSR had come from. I'd like to reflect for a moment on the fact that a 15-year-old had access to firearms and used them without needing his parents' consent. This may seem strange to those of us who grew up in the city or suburbs without regular access to outdoor activities. For a family who had been multi-generational farmers, this was not strange in the slightest. In farming communities, children are taught to handle firearms from the moment they are strong enough to hold them. Boys in particular will be taught to use a firearm at a very early age and join their fathers in hunting activities before they are teenagers. It was well known that, although the Steenkamps were safety conscious in terms of keeping doors locked, their safe, which held their guns, almost always stood open, and many family members confirmed that it would not have been strange for Don to take a gun and go out shooting on the property without needing to ask anyone. The victim's hands were tested for GSR, and it was found that none of them had fired a gun that day. When the footage of the crime scene was shown, Don's room had been in disarray. His cupboard doors stood open and several t-shirts lay on the floor. The torn shirt that Duval had recovered from Don's bedroom was identified by Don as having been the shirt he was wearing when he discovered his family shot. In his version, he said that he'd been wearing the shirt when he knelt beside a dying Mortella. He claimed that he had held her and she had told him that she loved him and that she was dying. Don said that when he saw how much of her blood had gotten onto his shirt while he was holding her, he had started to push her away in disgust, and she had gripped his shirt neck and torn it. One of the most damning pieces of evidence which was led by the blood spatter technicians in court was that at least 10 of the blood stains found on Don's torn shirt were impact spatter from Martella. In order for Don to get impact spatter on his shirt, he would have had to been facing Martella when she incurred the blunt force trauma to her face. The other blood evidence found on Don's clothing also indicated something interesting. The blood had been in liquid form when it was transferred to his clothing. Blood is only liquid when it immediately leaves the body. As soon as it comes into contact with air, it starts to congeal. Don's account of having come back into the house and finding Martella already dying was proved incorrect. He was definitely present when blood started to exit her body. The fact that Don had gone to change his shirt that night before leaving the scene is for me one of the most telling things that he did. Picture, if you can bear it, coming across your entire family having been massacred. Your sister is dying in your arms, and although you've spent your entire life on a farm, no doubt seeing the slaughter of animals and hunting yourself, you suddenly find yourself disgusted by blood. Then, after your sister dies in your arms, you do not call for help or immediately flee. You first go to your bedroom and look for a very specific shirt to change into. He changed his shirt. It blows my mind. The very simple fact of the matter was that Don's version of events could not fit the timeline or the evidence. He claimed that he had left his family alive and well at approximately quarter past six to go into the barn to fix a light fitting. He says that almost immediately upon entering the barn, he had heard gunshots. When he heard the first gunshot, he didn't think it abnormal but the rest of the shots frightened him, and he hid. When the gunshot stopped, Don says he ran inside and found his family dead and dying. Martella had died in his arms, and he had left the premises in the vehicle, stopping to advise the farm workers that they should leave the farm and to pick up the firearms at the gate. 
Don would continually adjust his version to meet the new evidence that was raised. When he was asked why he only heard one round of gunshots when the perpetrator had shot the victim with different firearms, he changed his story and said he had forgotten that he had ran inside and then ran back out to the barn, then heard more gunshots, then ran back into the house for a second time, and on this occasion, Martella had died in his arms. The reason that it was impossible for Don's version of events to fit the timeline is that, although he hadn't known it at the time, his mother sent a text message to her sister at 18.34. Don arrived at the police station at 18.57. This allowed 23 minutes for his version of events to occur, including at least 10 minutes to travel into town. So, 15 minutes for him to be in the barn, hear the first round of gunshots, go inside, go back into the barn, hear the second round of gunshots, return to the house, have Martella die in his arms, go into his room, change his shirt, and then run to the vehicle. He then still had to drive to the gate, shout to the farm workers to warn them, pick up the guns, and drive to town. It was pretty much impossible. Even the state's version of events would barely fit the timeline. But if one considered that the acts had been premeditated and planned, it was far more likely to be achieved in just over 20 minutes. The state proved that Martella had been shot in the chest inside the house, and escaped outside, where she had collapsed on the grass. Her attack had followed her, and a struggle had ensued on the grass, where it is presumed that Martella incurred the devastating blunt force injuries to her face. A large pool of blood was found on the grass outside, indicating the place where the fight took place. This area was in direct view of the window of the barn where Don claimed he had been hiding. In fact, He said that he had been hiding behind a workbench where he would have had direct sight of the attack on his sister, yet he claimed to have seen nothing. The blood spatter evidence showed that Martella had made it back into the house, whether by her own volition or being dragged there, we don't know. Another terribly sad revelation was that, at some stage after she was initially injured, Martella had gone to check on her parents. Her blood was found dripped onto their bodies, as though she had stood over them. In her last moments, this young girl's thoughts were for the well-being of her parents. I cannot, and honestly don't want to, imagine what must have been going through her mind when she realized they were both dead. In stark contrast, and in another very telling act, Don admitted that he did not, at any time, check on either of his parents. He didn't feel for a pulse, touch their bodies, or even call their names. When asked why he hadn't done so, he stated that he could see that they were dead, so there was no point. Don's torn shirt is still a question to this day. An exact replica was brought into the court, and several witnesses were even asked to see if they could tear it grown men struggled. This brought into question how Don could have claimed that Martella had torn it in her dying moments. If she tore it at all, it would have had to been very shortly after the attack started, when she was still filled with adrenaline and fighting for her life. Certainly not after she had lost copious amounts of blood. It is interesting to me that despite receiving serious chest wounds, Martella was able to move around and fight back so ferociously when her parents succumbed to their injuries very quickly. There are numerous accounts across the world of children surviving plane crashes, earthquakes and car accidents when all the adults involved have died. A few articles I read put this down to children being more physically fit to begin with. They are also smaller so blood loss may not impact them as quickly as it would an adult. Their hearts are stronger, and therefore able to beat longer and withstand more than an adult heart. I think that this, combined with the release of adrenaline, could also be an explanation for how Martello managed to tear a shirt that a grown man struggled to replicate under normal conditions. 
When we experience something that evokes a fear reaction in us, our body releases adrenaline into our system, which goes to work increasing our body functions in order to be able to flee or fight the threat. Our heart beats faster, our breathing speeds up, and we receive a jolt of energy to our muscles, which enables us to perform acts that we may not ordinarily be able to. Lifting a car is probably a stretch, but I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that adrenaline coursing through Martella's veins gave her enough strength to tear a t-shirt. Something interesting I came across when researching the effects of adrenaline on the human body is that when a person receives an electric shock and is thrown a considerable distance from the source, it's not actually the electricity that is moving you. As the electrical energy courses through your muscles, they contract at their full potential, and it is actually the contraction of your own muscles that pushes you away. This is an indication that the full potential use of our muscles, when they are completely stimulated, is far beyond what we realize. As witnesses were called to testify, a picture was painted of Don in the days immediately preceding and after the murders. Joe Scholtz, the neighbour who had been the first person from the community to arrive on the scene, testified that Don had told him a few days before his parents' murders that he didn't want to attend Grey College anymore. The boy said that the only reason he had to go there was because it suited his mother's image in the community and he would much rather go to a local school, where he could spend more time farming with his father. Scholz had told Don that he should be grateful that his parents could afford to send him to such a prestigious school. Henriette Tritter, who managed a proviant restaurant across from the police station, and took Don over to comfort him that night, was also called to testify. Tritter stated, that one thing that stood out for her was that she had seen grown men sob uncontrollably that night when they had discovered what had happened to their friends. But Don had only shed a tear or two and did not seem very upset at all. Trita also stated that as soon as she had seated Don in the restaurant, he had whipped his cell phone out of his pocket and started messaging and phoning people. He had asked Trita whether she thought that he should let all of his friends know or just his best friends. This was an hour after his entire family was slaughtered. Trita said that she had been completely taken aback and told the boy that it wasn't necessary for anyone outside the family to know at that moment. She stated that she did not know what to say to comfort him, so at one point... She had told him that there was always the hope that perhaps someone had survived and they should wait to hear from the police. He looked up at her and said in a monotone, No, Tony, they're all definitely dead, before looking back down at his cell phone. Trita, amongst others, had mentioned that Don was talking loudly that night, which she put down to his distress. When reporter Jacques Dienkamp tweeted this piece of information, he received a reply saying that when you fire a .357 Magnum revolver in an enclosed space, the sound is deafening and can result in the shooter talking louder than normal. I did a bit of research into this and came up with a term called shooter's ear. It is actually a very real phenomenon, which occurs with the use of certain firearms in an enclosed area. This is why people wear hearing protection at shooting ranges. According to a website on audiology I found, one shot from a three fifty seven revolver exposes the shooter to 165 decibels of sound, which is equivalent to a Boeing 727 taking off next to your head. Don's activity on his cell phone was key in the trial with him having sent messages to a friend just a few hours after the murders, saying that he was a suspect. Don was not a suspect at all at this time, as most people still believed it was a farm attack. His friend replied asking why the police suspected him, and Don said it was because his DNA and fingerprints were on the scene. 
He further advised his friend that they weren't going to find any other DNA or fingerprints there, only his. How could a 15-year-old Don possibly know that the police's investigation would not bring up any other suspects beside him, before the investigation had even begun? The only way he would know is that if he knew no one else had been there that night, it had just been Don and his three victims. A cell phone analyst also testified that he had analysed cell phone activity on all of the cell phones that had been present at Nohook that day. It emerged that a few days before, Don had invited a friend to sleep over that night, and the friend had cancelled at the last minute by leaving a voicemail on Don's phone. He tried several times to reach the friend's phone that night, shortly before the murders. If that friend had come to visit that evening, would the murders still have occurred? Were there several phone calls to the friend, Don's way of making sure that he had understood correctly, that he wasn't coming, to ensure he wasn't surprised in the middle of the attack? Unfortunately, despite sending Martella's cell phone to the manufacturer, police had been unable to access her data due to a password protection. Considering the allegations of sexual abuse, I wonder what may have been found on Martella's cell phone. As the various witnesses testified, it also began to emerge that Don had told many different stories to many different people. All these stories contained small but critical changes, most especially in the reason he claims to have gone to the barn that night. He had mentioned to one witness that he had heard Marcella screaming inside the house. This is a pretty huge thing to have forgotten to include in his official statement. In the continuing theme of Don remembering information to explain new questions or evidence, he had decided a few days after the murder that there had been a bank bag of cash inside the safe, and that must have been what the robbers stole. There was an empty bank bag found just outside the safe, but when Don explained where this was usually stored in relation to the guns in the safe, Duval had realised that in order for this to be true, the thieves would have had to unpack the entire safe, retrieve the money bag, then repack the safe as neatly as it was found. It would also make no sense to leave the money bag behind and remove the cash. The testimony of the farm workers, who sadly all lost their jobs and the homes many had lived in for most of their lives when Nohook went dormant after the murders, brought a lighter tone to the proceedings. In language which was not always fit for a courtroom, they testified how they'd been drinking a homemade alcoholic beverage that day, and they'd all been quite drunk when they'd seen Don Steenkamp driving up to the gate. In contrast to Don's statement that he had approached the workers while he was driving out the premises, the farm workers testified that he had only stopped driving when one of them had seen him and waved at him. He had then rolled down the window and told them to flee as someone had shot his whole family. The rape charge evidence was led by a team of pathologists with significant experience in sexual assault cases. One testified that Martella's sexual organs showed damage, which had healed, and then new damage, which must have been incurred within 12 hours of death. The pathologist testified that such damage could only have been caused by forceful penetration. Another pathologist testified that Martella had lost her virginity quite some time before the attack. She agreed that this loss of virginity could have coincided with the older injury to her sexual organs, but she could not state this for sure. Scratch marks were found on Martella's lower back, which the pathologist testified were consistent with someone scratching her while forcefully pulling down her pants. The defence had tried to claim that the injury to Martella's sexual organs was caused by a tampon or sanitary towel. The pathologist said that this was not possible, as the girl had not been menstruating at the time of her murder. A timeline had been developed of the movements of the family that day in order to ascertain whether any other male persons could have had access to Martella. Investigators pieced together that the family had attended a church service in the morning and then returned to the farm. When they returned to the house, they had lunch, and then Don may have gone out to shoot Meerkat. When he returned, 
Motala had indicated that she wished to ride her horse on the property, and Don had accompanied her. After their horse ride, the family had sat outside on the lawn watching Buck that came to drink at the watering hole. They had returned inside, where Dion and Motala had sat in front of the television, and Christelle had sat at her computer. It was determined that no other males besides Don and Dion had access to Motala that day. The belief was that when the children had gone horse riding, the sexual assault had occurred at that time. On the 18th of November 2013, Don Steenkamp very unexpectedly took the stand in his own defence. Don's version changed ever so slightly again when he testified, as he now said that he had changed his shirt after Martella died and had gone to the vehicle, and it was then that he had heard the second round of gunshots. In cross-examination, Kluter asked Don why he had not armed himself when he entered the house, if he had been under the impression that there were attackers there. Kluter made it quite clear that he found it odd that Don had thought to change his shirt, but not to arm himself, when he had just witnessed the savagery that the alleged attackers had wrought upon his family members. I think that's a very good point, and Don's only response was that he didn't think about it at the time. In questioning Don, Klitzer made it very clear that in order for an outside person to have committed this crime, they would have had to either get into the house while the family was watching Kudu on the lawn, wait 45 minutes, and then perfectly time their attack on the family to coincide with Don leaving the room, when he wasn't even a major threat compared to 140 kilogram Dion. Or the person would have had to have somehow gotten through the lounge and into the main bedroom without being seen, which, due to the layout of the house, was impossible. Don could not explain this, nor could he explain why the savage attacker would allow him to leave unscathed. According to his version, he had been in the house between the two rounds of gunfire, which indicated that the alleged perpetrators were still on the scene. Don could also not explain why they let him live. Klutter tore apart virtually every part of the boy's statement until the only card he had to play was to lay the blame at his defence team's door. He claimed that he had told them the different version of events, but they hadn't done anything about it. It was also pointed out to Don that he had never asked whether anyone had been apprehended or requested an update on the case. When asked why he had so much blood on him if, as was his version, he had not touched Don or Christelle, and barely touched his sister, Don stared blankly at Clutter. Something that I found a bit weird was, four days before the murder, Don had placed a picture of himself on Facebook in which he had just killed a kudu, and he was posing with the animal. In what I discovered from research is a hunter's tradition, he had bathed his hands in the blood of his prey. It never made sense to me why Don's hands were so completely covered in Martella's blood. I could be reaching, but was this perhaps also part of Don's hunter's tradition? Klitzer then asked a question which came completely out of left field. He asked Don to explain how his blood had ended up on his shorts. The boy and his defense team were taken completely off guard. Don once again claimed not to know, and Clitter suggested that this had happened in the struggle with Martella. Perhaps as she was wildly lashing out, trying to save her own life, she had hit Don in the nose, causing it to bleed. That was the only acceptable explanation, and Don did not have an alternate version to offer. When Clitter addressed the rape charge with Don, he asked Don about an argument he had claimed to have had with Martella on the day of the murders. Don couldn't recall what they had argued about. Clitter then put it to Don that if Martella had been raped by a stranger, she would have undoubtedly immediately raised the alarm. But when she was raped by someone so close to her, she felt shame and was too afraid to initially raise the alarm. Clitter told Don that he believed when they had argued it was the rape that they had argued about, and the fact that Martella was going to tell her father. He then said to Don, You raped Martella and murdered her and her parents to hide the truth. 
Don sat silently, glaring at Glitter. He did not answer. I don't know about you, but if someone accused me of not just incest, but forced sexual assault and three murders, I would have something to say about that. I would deny it until my last breath. I most definitely would not sit there in silence. Don's entire testimony oozed with arrogance and nonchalance. He clearly detested Plitter and showed it. When the boy wasn't changing his story, he was saying that he didn't know or he didn't remember. When the defense team made its closing argument, two absolutely shocking claims were made. The defense attorney implied that it was possible that Dion had raped his daughter, and it was also possible that the sexual act had been consensual between Don and Martella. It was a completely baseless claim, and there was no evidence to back it up. The judge had severely reprimanded the defense team for even raising such a weak point, and they responded by saying they were instructed to do so by their client. The next day, Don Steenkamp fired his entire legal team. Throughout the trial, there had been rumors that the family felt that the defense team was overcharging in order to milk the trust fund that was paying for Don's defense. I have no doubt that Don really did instruct his lawyers to make the wild claim about his father, but nevertheless, they were fired for it. The trial was postponed while Don's new legal team familiarized themselves with the case. When the proceedings resumed in March 2014, Don's new legal team tried to have the trial reopened as they claimed to have an additional pathologist who would testify that the injury to Martella's sexual organs was either from her scratching herself or from an infection. The state quickly blew this out the water by showing that Martella's nails were extremely short and it would have been impossible for her to inflict such an injury on herself and that the autopsy showed no signs of infection in her sexual organs. The judge denied leave to reopen the trial, stating that he believed the accused had had more than sufficient legal defense, and none of the so-called new evidence they were trying to introduce would hold any water. The judge found Don Steenkamp guilty on three counts of murder, one count of rape, and one count of obstruction of justice. Two days before his 18th birthday, he was sentenced to a total of 76 years in prison. The sentences, however, will be served concurrently, so essentially he will only serve 20 years in prison, as in South Africa, a minor younger than 16 cannot be sentenced to more than 20 years in jail, regardless of the severity of his crime. Don was 15 years and 8 months old, when he committed the murders. Shortly after being found guilty, Don's legal team announced that it would be submitting an application to appeal. The last article I found about this appeal was in 2015, and I found no outcome online. I would be surprised if he was given the opportunity to appeal, as you would ordinarily need new evidence or significant evidence of a miscarriage of justice. And from what I've seen, Neither exist in this case. In 2015, Don's original attorneys took Benny Hecruit to court for outstanding legal fees. The last mention of this in the media was in 2017, and there has been no mention of a resolution or outcome since then. From the evidence gathered, this is what investigators believe happened on that fateful day. The Steenkamp family attended church that morning, and came back to Nohook. The family had lunch. Martella decided to go riding, and Don joined her. At some time while out on this horse ride, Don raped Martella. It was not the first time he had done it, and this time, Martella had vowed to tell their parents. They had argued, and returned to the farm where tension simmered. The family sat outside for a while, and then returned inside. Dion and Martella sat on the couch, watching television, and Christelle sat at her computer. 
Don decided that he could not take the chance that his sister would tell his parents about the rape, and if he killed his parents, he could inherit and wouldn't need to answer to anyone anymore. He got up and went to his parents' bedroom, where he removed the 357 revolver from their safe. He first shot Christelle, approaching from behind and shooting her in the back. Splinters of the wooden chair she was sitting on were found in her wound. On witnessing this, Dion and Martella stood up from the couch. Don shot Martella once. Dion charged at Don, who fired two shots into his father. Dion skidded across the floor and collapsed. Martella ran outside and Don followed her, firing one shot in her direction while she ran. A physical altercation occurred on the grass outside where Martella had been severely beaten. He left her outside and returned inside to beat his father over the head with a gun. Don went back into the bedroom to retrieve the twenty-two caliber rifle. When he re-entered the lounge area, he found that Martella had come back into the house and tried to use the phone to call for help, and then collapsed at some stage. Don then fired a shot from the rifle into the head of each of his victims. He changed his shirt and fled the scene in the bucky. The Grikostad murders rocked South Africa. Not only had a family been killed by one of its own, but the perpetrator was a minor, and the added rape of his own sister blows the mind even further. A familiar side of this nature is what is called a black swan event. The phrase dates back to a time when people believed black swans either didn't exist or were extremely rare. Bronwyn Stollar stated in the Profiler Africa episode that she had been told by an American colleague that she had consulted about this case, that she would probably never see another one in her career. In fact, during her five years at SAPS, she worked on three such cases. Granted, it is far more common for the adult male of the family to be the perpetrator, but I can think of at least two other high-profile cases in South Africa where a child was the perpetrator. Parasite is the killing of both parents, and there are usually three motives for parasites. Either the perpetrator is being abused and sees murder as the only way out. They may be mentally ill and believe that their parents are trying to kill them. Or the offender may exhibit an antisocial motive, where the killings of a personal gain, usually inheritance. In Don's case, I think the latter was a big part of the motive. He had, on many occasions, expressed the desire to stop attending school and start farming. He had often described how he would change the farms if he was in control, and that he wanted to invest in petrol stations. His parents lived very modestly, despite their immense wealth, and I don't think that this fit in with what Don wanted. His immediate interest in how he could get his inheritance is further confirmation of this for me. Siblicide, the killing of a sibling, is extremely rare. So much so that I could find very little research on the topic. This instance of siblicide, however, I think has quite a complex motive. In my opinion, Don was obsessed with Martella. She was everyone's ideal of perfection, and everything he found it difficult to be. Rape is about power, not sex and anyone who thinks that Don simply took advantage of Martella's presence because he was a hormonal teenager is deluded. Don raped his sister because he wanted to control her and have power over her. There is another darker side to the sexual assault though, I believe, one which even Don probably doesn't fully understand. In the pre-sentencing hearing, Don described Martella as the most beautiful girl he had ever known. He had even taken some of her possessions from her room to keep with him. To him, he may have thought that this was a way to explain that he would never hurt someone that was so precious to him. But to me, that statement tells us everything we need to know about his relationship with his sister. Martella was the most beautiful girl he had ever known. Martella was the most of everything. And in her shadow, Don, through his own delusions, felt smaller. By raping her, 
I wonder if Don felt that he wasn't somehow defiling her and making her less worthy of the immense love and admiration that people had for her. Martella was not executed like her mother. She was tortured and brutally killed in a manner which would cause her the most pain. I also wonder whether the beating of Dion was because Don was afraid he would get up again, or was it really Don's way of exerting his dominance over his father too? It can surely be no coincidence that the two people in his life, who he probably felt overshadowed by, received the most brutal deaths. Sexual assault is a horrifying thing to experience for anyone, but when it is at the hands of your big brother, the person who is supposed to protect and care for you, I think that it must be completely terrifying. We don't know when Martella was raped for the first time by Don, but I tend to think that it was not long before the last attack. I cannot imagine what Martello must have been going through during that time, and honestly, I'm not surprised that she had struggled to tell someone. Don may have well threatened her with violence before, but even if he hadn't, how do you as a 14-year-old girl find the courage to tell someone that your own brother has been raping you? She may have been afraid of the ramifications of saying something, would it tear her family apart? Perhaps she even wondered if people might think that she had done something to cause it. These are, unfortunately, the things that go through the mind of a rape survivor, and these are also the things that the perpetrator uses to ensure they keep their victim quiet. It is too late now for anyone to help Martella, but I wish she had known that she did absolutely nothing wrong. Martella, you did not ask for that to happen to you. You did nothing to deserve it. We believe you, and we know now what he did. You were strong, beautiful, amazing young girl, loved by so many, and nothing would ever change that. As hard as he tried, he still has not sullied your memory. You fought him, and you may have physically lost but thousands stood up for you to make sure that you eventually won the battle. If you are listening to this and you are in a situation like Martella, please Google her picture and look at her. Does she look like someone who has anything to be ashamed of? No, she doesn't. And neither do you. Please tell someone before it's too late. I will leave the contact details for the 24-hour rape crisis hotline in the show notes. As human beings, we like to explain things, especially horrific acts like the slaying of the Steenkamp family. We like to be able to put a label on it and say this is why he did it, and clearly he's just abnormal, so we don't really need to worry about something like this happening to us. Well, unfortunately for us, this one can't be explained away by diagnoses just yet. Don Steenkamp only scored 14 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist administered to him. He was constantly described as emotionless during his trial, but as Jacques Steenkamp pointed out, he actually wasn't devoid of emotion. He just wasn't displaying the emotions we wanted him to. He was angry. He was irritated. He was bored. He was even happy. He just didn't display sadness or grief. Bronwyn Stolars was asked to assess Don Steenkamp for the state in the pre-sentencing phase. She found him to be very manipulative in interviews. When she asked him a question, he would turn it back on her and say that she should tell him what he should answer. She described him as very calm and polite. This odd manner of turning the question back on Stolars could be explained by the fact that Hekluert and some of his other supporters had instructed him not to cooperate with psychologists in assessments. Indeed, his defense seemed so concerned 
that something may be revealed in these assessments that Don's appointed psychologist continually interrupted them. The fact that Don did not exhibit any diagnosable mental illnesses at the time of his trial was not strange. As he was a minor, he's still developing psychologically, and most serious mental illnesses will only be diagnosable in his early 20s. It is therefore imperative that he continues to be assessed and undergo full assessments before his release so that we can truly know what we are dealing with. Bronwyn Stollars states that the problem with these types of juvenile offenders is that they are generally well-behaved children anyway, so their conduct while incarcerated is not always a good indication of their suitability for release. Don's sexual offence is one of the most concerning, as it is very difficult to completely rehabilitate sexual offenders, and especially when one has committed the crime at such a young age. Stollers found Don's sexual expression to be abnormal, as when his phone records were reviewed after his arrest, it was found that he had been viewing porn in the months after his family's murders. Of course, this in itself is not uncommon or abnormal, but Stollers stated that usually one will see a decrease in sexual arousal during times of extreme stress, but Don did not seem to be affected in the same way. My heart goes out to Don's extended family, his aunts and grandparents on both sides especially. I don't think it's possible to imagine being in such a situation. Three beloved members of your family have been slaughtered and one raped, and the offender is your own flesh and blood. It would be easy for us to say that we would cut all ties with such a person and refuse to support him in any way but I honestly think that situation is so complex and those people would have been torn in so many different directions that they could only do what felt right at the time. On the one hand, this person is a murderer and rapist, but on the other hand, he's your nephew or grandchild. And what about what his parents would have wanted? There are very few parents that disown their children after they commit crimes and cut all ties with them. They are still your children, after all. Perhaps Don's grandparents especially felt that, in a way, they would be honouring the memory of Dion and Christelle by giving Don support where they could. There were two very clear camps around Don during the investigation and trial. One consisted of ardent supporters, like Hekluet and a few others, who believe, even to this day, despite all the evidence, that Don is innocent. The other camp was mostly made up of his family, who did not want to see him come to harm and were willing to help him get the best defense he could, but they didn't seem to believe he was innocent either. One of Dion's sisters spoke to a journalist about how she felt about Don and the crime. She described how shocked she'd been when she saw the photographs of the crime scene but Don had just sat there drinking his Coca-Cola and looking at the photographs like they were family holiday snaps. She also pointed out that Don had taken the album of evidence photographs from his lawyer and paged through them too. There was absolutely no need for him to do that. Don's aunt also found it strange that he was able to go and eat lunch every single day after looking at gruesome photographs of his family having been slaughtered. The woman recalled Don once asking her if she had ever seen his parents cry because he claimed that he had never seen his father cry and he couldn't understand why everyone was making a big deal about him not crying. He was just doing what he thought was right. She told Don in no uncertain terms that his father had cried on many occasions, even when he was the same age as Don. She described that Don had always been her favourite, but now she felt like there was a massive divide between them. She said that she felt her nephew was now a stranger. Don's paternal grandfather passed away during his trial after suffering a stroke. He was 80 years old and had not been in very good health even before the murders of his son, 
daughter-in-law and granddaughter. One thing that I must admit I found a bit odd was how the family handled the estate proceeds from Dion and Christelle. The estate was worth 23 million rand and would automatically go to Don. However, due to him being on trial for his family's murders, Don would be unavailable to receive this inheritance. There is also a law in South Africa that states that the bloody hand cannot inherit. In other words, you cannot benefit from the estate of a person you are found guilty of killing. The Steenkamps found a legal route around this. The money from Dion and Christelle's estates went to Dion's parents in the event of Don being unavailable to inherit. So Don's grandfather opened a trust and donated the inheritance into the trust. This then made the money a donation and not an inheritance. Don Steenkamp could get out of prison as early as 28 years old. When he does, he will legally have access to more than 23 million rand. This bothers me. It really does. He doesn't deserve that money. I don't know if the farms were all sold, but perhaps this decision was made in order to keep the farms in the Steenkamp family. Don was the only male grandchild with the Steenkamp name, so perhaps this was a last-ditch attempt by the old man to try and keep his bloodline on no hook. I know that this is a big thing for families in the farming community, so although I might not understand or agree with it, I respect that such things are important in traditional families like the Steenkamps. Don's paternal grandmother perhaps summed up the family's feelings best in a letter she wrote which was read out at Don's sentencing hearing. The letter was titled, The Tears on My Own. The following is an excerpt from that letter. Quote, The sorrow of 6 April changed everything. How difficult it still is to talk about that day. The news of the death of my son daughter-in-law and granddaughter, will always be the worst news I have ever heard. Our hearts are broken, and their places will forever remain empty. Taking into account all the evidence that I have heard this past week from various experts and other witnesses, I can't help but realize that the murders were committed by my beloved grandson, who surely must suffer from a highly negative character flaw. End quote. In Jacques Dienkamp's book, he ends with the following poignant words, quote, The worst part is that Don Steenkamp, the Griekwestad murderer, will be eligible for parole after serving just 50% of his sentence, meaning that he could be released back into society before his 28th birthday. He will be free to walk straight into the nearest bank, where his parents' multi-million rand inheritance will be waiting for him. I am not sure if justice has really been done here. All I know is that I promise to hound him for the truth, because one day I want to hear him say the words, I killed my family. End quote. Thank you for listening to episode 6 of True Crime South Africa. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review on the podcatcher you use. We are getting a lot of reviews on Apple Podcasts, and I really appreciate everyone that's taken the time to do so. I love interacting with you and hearing your feedback on our website and all our social media channels, so please continue to leave messages and interact with us there. Whenever I post a case episode, I upload the transcript to our website too and include photographs related to the case as well. So if you'd like to go through the info again, you can do that there. If you do order the Griekwestad Murders book, there's a website link at the end of the book which takes you to a website set up by Jacques Steenkamp. On the website is more information about the case, a copy of the verdict transcript, and exclusive crime scene photographs. As always, 
A huge thank you to Prime Circle for allowing us to use their song Evidence as our soundtrack. The last thank you goes out to you, our amazing listeners, who make this podcast a reality every time you listen and share. Thank you, and I'll chat to you soon.